That's Kong. He's king around here. He's god to these people. Kong is film history. It's what blew open the doors for so many people on what was possible or imaginable with cinema. What we're doing is trying to pay homage to that and then create something incredible and new and fresh. When we first started talking to Jordan about the project, he really emphasized how much Kong is so unique as far as what he represents, not only as a character, but as a technological innovation with each uh, iteration of him that's been out there. This Kong is completely new. The scale with which he's been conceived is vast. He was just the king of the monster movies and everything else that came with it. So now to have this opportunity to be able to revamp the Kong in a new era of technology, it's incredible. Some of our early animation tests were very primate-centric. Kong walking on all fours, acting like a traditional primate. The director immediately responded with, whoa, guys, this character is not a gorilla. This is a evolutionary offshoot between man and gorilla, kind of a Neanderthal. Our Kong is much more of a movie monster. He has gorilla-like anatomy, but everything's pushed to the extreme. He has a much more prominent chin, and his lips are more defined. It meant we really had to blend what we saw in the human reference and what we saw in the gorilla reference. We modeled and showed it to Jordan. He's like, push it further. He really drove back towards a lot of the key elements of that 33 Kong. He's 100 feet tall. And the reason that we did that is because it became exciting and important to me that when people step foot on this island, their first response is to look at that thing and say, that's a god. Our Kong is closer to the 33 version of the character. With that comes a lot of different challenges. Our biggest challenge right off the bat was going to be the fact that he was 100 feet tall. He walks upright. How do we film him for a anamorphic movie with a very narrow aspect ratio? Uh, the lead's about 100 feet. Great. Action! A lot of times we would use a program that we've developed here at ILM called Cineview where you can load up Kong on an iPad. This is our Kong visualizer. Basically, we can put Kong in here. And so here, he happens to be laying down, but we can move him around. And it's really just a tool designed for visualization on set. To help poor, uh, hampered uh, <laughs> camera operators figure out what to do. He's probably one of the densest models we've built. I think it was over half a million polygons, almost half of the polygons in the face, because in the close-up shots, you see every detail, all the wrinkles. So we wanted to have the resolution in the face. We have shots of Kong that go right into his eye. So we knew that his skin textures and his eyes, they all had to hold up to very, very extreme close-ups. A lot of shots were just going to be his foot or just his hand. At 100 feet tall, we were going to be seeing every single part of him in detail. <laughs> Initially, we did do a couple of capture sessions with Terry Notary and Toby Kebble, and that was mainly to have the director work with the performer to find who Kong is and get the very fast iterative feedback from those performers who have a lot of experience doing primate performance. Those capture sessions did provide reference for animators to base their shots on. When you transfer motion capture to a 100-foot tall creature, it's a very different thing. And we ended up keyframing a lot of the film. Keyframe animation puts the majority of the responsibility for creating a performance in the animator's hands. We have to give the animators a control system so they can actually animate him. Once we got the animation back, we had a muscle system underneath, so we would simulate those muscles. And then we would have another layer, which is like the skin, which would simulate with the muscles so you could see the muscles underneath the skin slide around. 
like the shoulder blade. You can see shoulder blades move and they slide under the skin. And then after we had all that, then we would actually have the hair. He's covered by about 19 million hairs. You can sort of do an initial distribution of those through the software, but a lot of the, the detail styling and sculpting of the hair is all done by hand. You know, we had two artists working on it for almost a year just on getting all the different styles and, and looks to his hair. Most of our time was actually spent trying to figure out how to mess up his fur. Through the course of the film, he accumulates damage and also how do we get him wet? And that was something we hadn't really done before with so much uh, fur and water interaction. where he's lit on fire, essentially. And so that was an entirely new look to the fur, where we have a lot of singed fur and blackened fur. And we had to do a lot of technology development to figure out how do we sustain that damage throughout the film so there's continuity. <laughs> Hong's scale really demands a lot of time to convey a sense of scale, and you also can use that time for these transition moments. The emotional, quiet moments are more difficult and time-consuming to get right than the, the broad action beats. The options are almost limitless as to how an emotional performance can be delivered. It was important for us to show Kong's transition on the ridge with Brie Larson. I think there's something really beautiful about the fact that Kong is king, and yet he doesn't choose to use that power in a way that's harmful. I just remember the first time I ever was with an elephant, <laughs> and I was like completely intrigued and totally terrified at the same time. Like I kept taking a step closer and then running away and then coming up closer, because there's this gentleness to their soul, but at the same time, you know that they are the one with the upper hand. They can crush you at any moment, and yet they don't. I mean, that's kind of where a lot of the inspiration came from for how I was going to feel that moment. The emotional transition on Kong is conveyed all through his eyes. You can see this kind of intensity at the beginning of the scene, and by the end of it, he's go going more wide-eyed, almost as though he's uh, tearing up or willing up because of this connection that he's made with the character. Kill the son of a bitch. In the past, Kong has really gotten the best of by airplanes, so the director wanted to take the opportunity to kind of give Kong the upper hand. Let's show the audience what it would look like if Kong was in control of the battle. I think that the take that uh, Jordan took on this was, was very interesting. He put him into Vietnam, an you know, Apocalypse Now type of scenario. I think it made it visually interesting, a little bit grittier, you know, that kind of throwback to Heart of Darkness sort of feel to it. Having the, the actual footage from Vietnam with actual Vietnam era helicopters really influenced the look of our all CG environments so that you can not tell the difference between the real stuff and what we created here at ILM. Even though the actual physical shoots happened in Hawaii and Australia and in Vietnam, we wanted it all to look like Vietnam. A lot of that started with building a set of all the mountains. You know, so we had a LiDAR scan and a ton of photography and built a set and then defined like where all of this action is happening. And all of these different areas have their own sort of setups and their own sort of feeling. From sunsets on the ocean with this big storm happening right in front of you, to then seeing a sunset silhouetted by Kong. So it's, it's quite different setups, a lot of different locations. The skull crawlers, it was a real challenge to sort of figure out the anatomy of that creature. The director came to us with the idea that the top of his body and the rib cage should be sort of translucent. You could see the bones through it. So normally we will build geometry inside the body to help with the simulation, but they're not meant to be seen.
Finding the way the skull crawler moved was a challenge for animators. You can figure out a lot about a character just by the way it walks, the posture, how fast the steps are, trying to get a sense of weight in there, what the tail might do. We used a variety of reference, everything from Komodo dragons to deer and buffalo. Surprisingly, uh, the way that deer and buffalo get up, they really thrust their heads forward to get their legs out from underneath them to stand up. So that was a, a reference we leveraged in the film to help motivate the skull crawler's performance. From a design perspective, they're creepy. And that's exactly what they need to serve in a story. So that later, when the mama comes out, okay, this is a formidable foe for Kong. For a baby, the skull crawler was still 40 feet tall and about 100 feet long. The mama was essentially twice as big, so you know, 80 feet tall and 200 feet long. A lot of the focus was on making sure that it felt like this creature could take on Kong. A huge challenge for that battle was creating fight moves that felt like animal behavior, not too human looking. You didn't want Kong throwing kicks or anything like that. So you're kind of limited with what type of moves that they can do on one another. And then you also want to take into consideration what their abilities are just based on their design. And then seeing all of that take place, splashing up water and mud, it was intense. The creatures are throwing each other into mountains and throwing each other into the water. And you have to make the environment live up and be something that's suitable for this to happen. That integration with water and the characters happens within the effect department. We, in the environment group, since we're creating everything that happens outside of that center stage, we have to work really closely with those guys to make sure that our water lines line up. With two creatures, it was a constant having to work out how to get them to interact with the environment properly. To make it look real, it takes quite a bit of effort. The complexity of what's in each of the shots was extraordinary. Every shot is really designed for maximum impact. Seems like every time somebody creates Kong for the big screen, they're pushing the envelope visual effects wise. So to be able to have an opportunity to contribute to that legacy was an awesome opportunity. Having a fresh take on something that had already been done and also creating this sort of larger scale and using the new technology to do it was very exciting. Kong is one of the very first creatures ever made for cinema. I think anybody that does this type of work has got to have a little soft spot for Kong. For anybody growing up a fan of visual effects, you know that every Kong film has been a huge technological advancement along with you know, creating this great character. Kong is a part of film history.